Chapter Seven of Hard Times by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hard Times by Charles Dickens. Chapter Seven, Whelp Hunting. Before the ring formed round the old hell shaft was broken, one figure had disappeared from within it. Mr. Bounderby and his shadow had not stood near Louisa, who held her father's arm, but in a retired place by themselves. When Mr. Gradgrind was summoned to the couch, Sissy, attentive to all that happened, slipped behind that wicked shadow, a sight in the horror of his face if there had been eyes there but for any sight but one, and whispered in his ear. Without turning his head, he conferred with her for a few moments, and vanished. Thus the whelp had gone out of the circle before the people moved. When the father reached home, he sent a message to Mr. Bounderby's, desiring his son to come to him directly. The reply was that Mr. Bounderby, having missed him in the crowd, and seen nothing of him since, had supposed him to be at Stone Lodge. "'I believe, father,' said Louisa, "'he will not come back to town to-night.' Mr. Gradgrind turned away, and said no more. In the morning he went down to the bank himself as soon as it was opened, and seeing his son's place empty—he had not the courage to look in first went back along the street to meet Mr. Bounderby on his way there, to whom he said that, for reasons he would soon explain, but entreated not then to be asked for, he had found it necessary to employ his son at a distance for a little while. Also that he was charged with the duty of vindicating Stephen Blackpool's memory, and declaring the thief. Mr. Bounderby, quite confounded, stood stock still in the street after his father-in-law had left him, swelling like an immense soap-bubble, without its beauty. Mr. Gradgrind went home, locking himself in his room, and kept it all that day. When Sissy and Louisa tapped at his door, he said, without opening it, "'Not now, my dears. In the evening.' On their return in the evening, he said, I am not able yet. To-morrow. He ate nothing all day, and had no candle after dark, and they heard him walking to and fro late at night. But in the morning he appeared at breakfast at the usual hour, and took his usual place at the table. Aged and bent he looked, and quite bowed down, Yet he looked a wiser man, and a better man, than in the days when in this life he wanted nothing but facts. Before he left the room he appointed a time for them to come to him, and so, with his grey head drooping, went away. "'Dear father,' said Louisa, when they kept their appointment, "'you have three young children left. They will be different. I will be different yet, with heaven's help." She gave her hand to Sissy, as if she meant with her help too. "'Your wretched brother,' said Mr. Gradgrind, "'do you think he had planned this robbery when he went with you to the lodging?' "'I fear so, father. I know he had wanted money very much, and had spent a great deal.' "'The poor man being about to leave the town, it came into his evil brain to cast suspicion on him?' I think it must have flashed upon him while he sat there, father, for I asked him to go there with me. The visit did not originate with him. He had some conversation with the poor man. Did he take him aside? He took him out of the room. I asked him afterwards why he had done so, and he made a plausible excuse. But since last night, father, and when I remember the circumstances by its light, I am afraid I can imagine too truly what passed between them. Let me know said her father, if your thoughts present your guilty brother in the same dark view as mine. I fear, father, hesitated Louisa, that he must have made some representation to Stephen Blackpool, 
perhaps in my name, perhaps in his own, which induced him to do in good faith and honesty what he had never done before, and to wait about the bank those two or three nights before he left the town. "'Too plain,' returned the father. "'Too plain.' He shaded his face, and remained silent for some moments. Recovering himself, he said, "'And now, how is he to be found? How is he to be saved from justice? In the few hours that I can possibly allow to elapse before I publish the truth, how is he to be found by us, and only by us? Ten thousand pounds could not affect it.' "'Sissy has affected it, father.' He raised his eyes to where she stood, like a good fairy in his house, and said in a tone of softened gratitude and grateful kindness, "'It is always you, my child.' "'We had our fears,' Sissy explained, glancing at Louisa, "'before yesterday, and when I saw you brought to the side of the litter last night, and heard what passed, being close to Rachel all the time, I went to him when no one saw, and said to him, "'Don't look at me.' See where your father is. Escape at once, for his sake and your own. He was in a tremble before I whispered to him, and he started and trembled more then, and said, Where can I go? I have very little money, and I don't know who will hide me. I thought of father's old circus. I have not forgotten where Mr. Sleary goes at this time of year, and I read of him in a paper only the other day. I told him to hurry there, and tell his name, and ask Mr. Sleary to hide him till I came. I'll get to him before the morning, he said and I saw him shrink away among the people. "'Thank heaven!' exclaimed his father. "'He may be got abroad yet.' It was more hopeful, as the town to which Sissy had directed him was within three hours' journey of Liverpool, whence he could be swiftly dispatched to any part of the world. But caution being necessary in communicating with him, for there was a greater danger every moment of his being suspected now, and nobody could be sure at heart but that Mr. Bounderby himself, in a bullying vein of public zeal, might play a Roman part, it was consented that Sissy and Louisa should repair to a place in question by a circuitous course alone, and that the unhappy father, setting forth in an opposite direction, should get round to the same bourne by another and wider route. It was further agreed that he should not present himself to Mr. Sleary, lest his intention should be mistrusted, or the intelligence of his arrival should cause his son to take flight anew, but that the communication should be left to Sissy and Louisa to open, and that they should inform the cause of so much misery and disgrace of his father's being at hand, and of the purpose for which they had come. When these arrangements had been well considered, and were fully understood by all three, it was time to begin to carry them into execution. Early in the afternoon Mr. Gradgrind walked directly from his own house into the country, to be taken up on the line by which he was to travel, and at night the remaining two set forth upon their different course, encouraged by not seeing any face they knew. The two travelled all night, except when they were left off, for odd numbers of minutes, at branch places, up illimitable flights of steps, or down wells, which was the only variety of those branches, and early in the morning were turned out on a swamp, a mile or two from the town they sought. From this dismal spot they were rescued by a savage old postilion, who happened to be up early kicking a horse in a fly, and so were smuggled into the town by all the back lanes where the pigs lived, which, although not a magnificent or even savoury approach, was, as is usual in such cases, the legitimate highway. The first thing they saw on entering the town was the skeleton of Sleary's Circus. The company had departed for another town more than twenty miles off, and had opened there last night. The connection between the two places was by a hilly turnpike road, and the travelling on that road was very slow. Though they took but a hasty breakfast, and no rest, which it would have been in vain to seek under such anxious circumstances, 
It was noon before they began to find the bills of Sleary's horse-riding on barns and walls, and one o'clock when they stopped in the market-place. A grand morning performance by the riders, commencing at that very hour, was in course of announcement by the bellmen, as they set their feet upon the stones of the street. Sissy recommended that, to avoid making inquiries and attracting attention in the town, they should present themselves to pay at the door. If Mr. Sleary were taking the money, he would be sure to know her, and would proceed with discretion. If he were not, he would be sure to see them inside, and knowing what he had done with the fugitive, would proceed with discretion still. Therefore they repaired, with fluttering hearts, to the well-remembered booth. The flag, with the inscription, Ceres Horse Riding, was there, and the Gothic niche was there, but Mr. Sleary was not. Master Kidderminster, grown too maturely turfy to be received by the wildest credulity as Cupid any more, had yielded to the invincible force of circumstances, and his beard, and in the capacity of a man who made himself generally useful, presided on this occasion over the exchequer, having also a drum in reserve on which to expend his leisure moments and superfluous forces. In the extreme sharpness of his lookout for base coin, Mr. Kidderminster, as at present situated, never saw anything but money. So Sissy passed him unrecognized, and they went in. The Emperor of Japan, on a steady old horse stenciled with black spots, was twirling five wash-hand basins at once, as it is the favorite recreation of that monarch to do. Sissy, though well acquainted with his royal line, had no personal knowledge of the present Emperor, and his reign was peaceful. Miss Josephine Sleary, in her celebrated, graceful, equestrian Tyrolean flower act, was then announced by a new clown, who humorously said cauliflower act, and Mr. Sleary appeared, leading her in. Mr. Sleary had only made one cut at the clown with his long whiplash, and the clown had only said, "'If the juice again, I'll throw the horse at you.' when Sissy was recognized both by father and daughter, but they got through the act with great self-possession, and Mr. Sleary, saving for the first instant, conveyed no more expression into his locomotive eye than into his fixed one. The performance seemed a little long to Sissy and Louisa, particularly when it stopped to afford the clown an opportunity of telling Mr. Sleary, who said, "'Indeed, sir,' to all his observations in the calmest way, and with his eye on the house, about two legs sitting on three legs, looking at one leg, when in came four legs, and laid hold of one leg, and got up two legs, caught hold of three legs, and threw em at four legs, who ran away with one leg. For, although an ingenious allegory related to a butcher, a three-legged stool, a dog, and a leg of mutton, this narrative consumed time, and they were in great suspense. At last, however, little fair-haired Josephine made her curtsy amid great applause, and the clown, left alone in the ring, had just warmed himself, and said, "'Now all have a turn,' when Sissy was touched on the shoulder and beckoned out. She took Louisa with her and they were received by Mr. Sleary in a very little private apartment, with canvas sides, a grass floor, and a wooden ceiling, all a slant, on which the box company stamped their approbation, as if they were coming through. Cecilia, said Mr. Sleary, who had brandy and water at hand, "'It does me good to see you. You was always a favorite with us and you've done us credit since the old times i'm sure you must see our people my dear afore we speak of business or they'll break their hearts especially the women 
Here's Josephine has been and got married to E.W.B. Childers, and she has got a boy, and though he's only three years old, he sticks it on to any pony you can bring against him. He's named the Little Wonder of Scholastic Equitation, and if you don't hear of that boy at Ashley's, you'll hear of him at Paris. And you recollect Kidder Mister that was thought to be rather sweet upon yourself? Well, he's married too. Married a widder, old enough to be his mother. She was tightrope, she was, and now she's nothing on account of fat. They've got two children, though we're strong in the fairy business and the nursery dodge. If you was to see our children in the wood, with their father and mother both a dying on a horse, their uncle a receiving of them, and as with warts upon a horse, themselves both a goin' a blackberrying on a horse, and the robins a comin' in to cover em with leaves upon a horse, you say it was the completest thing as ever you set your eyes upon. And you remember Emma Gordon, my dear, as was almost a mother to you? Of course you do, I needn't ask. Well, Emma, she's lost her husband. He was throwed a heavy backfall off an elephant in a sort of a pagoda thing as the Sultan of the Indias, and he never got the better of it. And she married a second time. Married a cheesemonger as fell in love with her from the front, and he's a overseer and making a fortune. These various changes, Mr. Sleary, very short of breath now, related with great heartiness and with a wonderful kind of innocence, considering what a bleary and brandy and watery old veteran he was. Afterwards he brought in Josephine, and E. W. B. Childers, rather deeply lined in the jaws by daylight, and the little wonder of scholastic equitation, and, in a word, all the company. Amazing creatures they were in Louise's eyes, so white and pink of complexion, so scant of dress, and so demonstrative of leg. But it was very agreeable to see them crowding about Sissy, and very natural in Sissy to be unable to refrain from tears. There, now Cecilia has kissed all the children, and hugged all the women, and shaken hands all round with all the men, clear every one of you, and ring in the band for the second part. As soon as they were gone, he continued in a low tone. Now, Cecilia, I don't ask to know any secrets, but I suppose I may consider this to be Miss Squire. This is his sister, yes. And t'other one's daughter? That's what I mean. Hope I see you well, miss, and I hope the squire is well. My father will be here soon, said Louisa, anxious to bring him to the point. Is my brother safe? Safe and sound, he replied. I want you just to take a peep at the ring, miss, through here. Cecilia, you know the dodge. Find a spy hole for yourself. They each looked through a chink in the boards. That's Jack the Giant Killer, piece of comic infant business, said Sleary. There's a property house, you see, for Jack to hide in. There's my clown with a saucepan lid and a spit for Jack's servant. There's little Jack himself in a splendid suit of armor. There's two comic black servants, twice as big as the house, to stand by it and to bring it in and clear it. And the giant, a very expensive basket one. He ain't on yet. Now, do you see em all? Yes, yes. They both said. Look at em again said Sleary. Look at em well. You see em all? Very good. Now, miss. He put a form for them to sit on. I have my opinions, and the squire your father has his. I don't want to know what your brother's been up to. It's better for me not to know. All I say is, the squire has stood by Cecilia, and I'll stand by the squire. Your brother is one of them black servants. Louisa uttered an exclamation, partly of distress, partly of satisfaction. It's a fact, said Sleary. And even knowing it, you couldn't put your finger on him. 
Let the squire come. I shall keep your brother here after the performance. I shan't undress him, nor yet wash his paint off. Let the squire come here after the performance, or come here yourself after the performance, and you shall find your brother, and have the whole place to talk to him in. Never mind the looks of him, as long as he's well hid. Louisa, with many thanks and with a lightened load, detained Mr. Sleary no longer then. She left her love for her brother, with her eyes full of tears, and she and Sissy went away until later in the afternoon. Mr. Gradgrind arrived within an hour afterwards. He too had encountered no one whom he knew, and was now sanguine, with Sleary's assistance, of getting his disgraced son to Liverpool in the night. As neither of them could be his companion, without almost identifying him under any disguise, he prepared a letter to a correspondent whom he could trust, beseeching him to ship the bearer off to any coast, to North or South America, or any distant part of the world to which he could be the most speedily and privately dispatched. This done, they walked about, waiting for the service to be quite vacated, not only by the audience, but by the company and by the horses. After watching it a long time, they saw Mr. Sleary bring out a chair and sit down by the side door, smoking, as if that were his signal that they might approach. "'Your servant, squire,' was his cautious salutation as they passed in. "'If you want me, you'll find me here. You mustn't mind your son having a comic livery on.' They all three went in. Mr. Gradgrind sat down forlorn on the clown's performing chair in the middle of the ring. On one of the back benches, remote in the subdued light and the strangeness of the place, sat the villainous whelp, sulky to the last, whom he had the misery to call his son. In a preposterous coat like a beetle's, with cuffs and flaps exaggerated to an unspeakable extent, in an immense waistcoat, knee-breeches, buckled shoes, and a mad cocked hat, with nothing fitting him, and everything of coarse material, moth-eaten and full of holes, with seams in his black face, where fear and heat had started through the greasy composition daubed all over it, anything so grimly, detestably, ridiculously shameful as the whelp in his comic livery, Mr. Gradgrind never could by any other means have believed in, weighable and measurable fact though it was, and one of his model children had come to this. At first the whelp would not draw any nearer, but persisted in remaining up there by himself, yielding at length, if any concession so suddenly made can be called yielding, to the entreaties of Sissy, for Louisa he disowned altogether, he came down, bench by bench, until he stood in the sawdust on the verge of the circle, as far as possible within its limits from where his father sat. "'How was this done?' asked the father. "'How was what done?' "'This robbery,' said the father, raising his voice upon the word. <sighs> I forced to save myself overnight, and shut it up a jar before I went away. I had had the key that was found made long before. I dropped it that morning that it might be supposed to have been used. I didn't take the money all at once. I pretended to put my balance away every night, but I didn't. Now you know all about it. If a thunderbolt had fallen on me, said the father, it would have shocked me less than this. I don't see why, grumbled the son. So many people are employed in situations of trust. So many people out of so many will be dishonest. I've heard you talk a hundred times of its being a law. How can I help laws? You have comforted others with such things, father. Comfort yourself. The father buried his face in his hands and the son stood in his disgraceful grotesqueness biting straw. 
his hands, with the black partly worn away inside, looking like the hands of a monkey. The evening was fast closing in, and from time to time he turned the whites of his eyes restlessly and impatiently towards his father. There were the only parts of his face that showed any life or expression. The pigment upon it was so thick. You must be got to Liverpool, and sent abroad. I suppose I must. I can't be more miserable anywhere, whimpered the whelp. And I've been here ever since I can remember. That's one thing. Mr. Gradgrind went to the door, and returned with Sleary, to whom he submitted the question, how to get this deplorable object away. Why, I've been thinking of it, Squire. There's not much time to lose. Though you must say yes or no, it's over twenty miles to the rail. There's a coach in half an hour that goes to the rail, purpose to catch the mail train. That train will take him right to Liverpool. But look at him. Will any coach— I don't mean that he shall go in the comic livery, said Sleary. Say the word, and I'll make a jaskin of him out of the wardrobe in five minutes. I don't understand, said Mr. Gradgrind. A jaskin, a carter. Make up your mind quick, squire. There'll be beer to fetch. I've never met with nothing but beer as I'll ever clean a comic blackamoor. Mr. Gradgrind rapidly assented. Mr. Sleary rapidly turned out from a box a smock frock, a felt hat, and other essentials. The whelp rapidly changed clothes behind a screen of bays. Mr. Sleary rapidly brought beer and washed him white again. Now, said Sleary, come along to the coat and jump up behind and I'll go with you there and they'll suppose you one of my people. Say farewell to your family and tharp's the word. Here is your letter, said Mr. Gradgrind. All necessary means will be provided for you. Atone by repentance and better conduct for the shocking action you have committed and the dreadful consequences to which it has led. Give me your hand, my poor boy, and may God forgive you as I do. The culprit was moved to a few abject tears by these words and their pathetic tone. But when Louisa opened her arms, he repulsed her afresh. Not you! I don't want to have anything to say to you. Oh, Tom! Tom, do we end so, after all my love? After all your love? He returned obdurately. Pretty love! Leaving old Bounderby to himself, and packing my best friend Mr. Hardhouse off, and going home just when I was in the greatest danger. Pretty love, that! Coming out with every word about our having gone to that place, when you saw the net was gathering round me. Pretty love that. You have regularly given me up. You never cared for me. Tharp the word, said Sleary, at the door. They all confusedly went out, Louisa crying to him that she forgave him and loved him still, and that he would one day be sorry to have left her so, and glad to think of these her last words far away, when some one ran against them. Mr. Gradgrind and Sissy, who were both before him, while his sister yet clung to his shoulder, stopped and recoiled. For there was Bitzer, out of breath, his thin lips parted, his thin nostrils distended, his white eyelashes quivering, his colourless face more colourless than ever, as if he ran himself into a white heat when other people ran themselves into a glow. There he stood, panting and heaving, as if he had never stopped since the night long ago when he had run them down before. "'I'm sorry to interfere with your plans,' said Bitzer, shaking his head. "'But I can't allow myself to be done by horse-riders. I must have young Mr. Tom. He mustn't be got away by horse-riders. Here he is in a smock-frock, and I must have him.' "'By the collar, too, it seemed.' For so he took possession of him. End of chapter 7